please stand up and stop this hatred. It cannot keep going on. Anti-Semitism on the rise, Jews in South Florida and across the country are increasingly the targets of hate crimes. What's behind it? What can be done to stop it? Evangelicals, Christians of every denomination and believers of every faith have never had a greater champion. Courting evangelicals, the president holds a rally at a big mega church in Miami and gets cheers and prayers. And I can assure you that Americans in the region are much safer today after the demise of Qasem Soleimani. Calculated risk, the president orders the assassination of a top Iranian general. Was it bold leadership or a risky gamble? We will take that to the round table. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney, Glenna is off today. We are going to begin by focusing on anti-Semitism and hate crimes against Jews. Those crimes, sadly, are up nearly 20%, according to the head of security for the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. This is an alarming increase. Last week in Muncie, New York, a mentally ill man attacked Jews taking part in a Hanukkah celebration, slashing five people with a machete. A couple of weeks before that, three people were shot to death at a convenience store in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in Jersey City. There were 835 anti-Jewish hate crimes in the New York City area last year. In South Florida, you recall last summer, 68-year-old Yosef Lifshutz was walking to his synagogue in Northeast Miami-Dade when a man jumped out of a car, shot him six times. That shooter has been charged with a hate crime. Local synagogues have heightened security, positioned armed guards. Uh, they have installed metal gates. They're using single person entrances. Jewish day schools have heightened their security too. But we cannot accept anti-Semitism. It hurts not just our Jewish friends and neighbors, but our entire community. So we want to talk about it with our guest today. Michael Balaban is president, chief operating officer at the Jewish Federation of Broward. Stephanie Viegas is security director for the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. She is a former special agent with the FBI. Carol Brick Turin is the Community Relations Council Director of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. And Brian Siegel is Director of the American Jewish Committee, the AJC of Miami and Broward. All of you, good morning. So glad morning, you could morning, come morning. in good morning. and you, appreciate this. Brian Siegel, let me begin with you. What do you think is causing this alarming uh, rise in acts of anti-Semitism, hate crimes against Jews? Well, thank you, Michael. It, it really defies an easy explanation it's uh, coming from many different sources. So that is one of the things that, that complicates it. We know at AJC, being engaged in global Jewish advocacy and seeing rising anti-Semitism in Europe and other parts of the world for many years that, and we also know from history that anti-Semitism comes about when there's fear and anger and people looking to blame others. Right. But in particular right now, we have a few theories. One is people are starting to forget the legacy of the Holocaust and the lessons that yeah. we have learned from 70, that. 75 years ago, and yet, I, I mean, it is the grimmest episode perhaps of the 20th century, the murder of six million Jews, mm -hmm. but somehow that lesson seems to have been forgotten by a younger generation. I think that's right. There's not as much knowledge or personal connection, so that's a big problem. Another big problem is that social media allows people to take these vile messages and spread yeah. them in a way that hasn't existed before. So we see tropes that we haven't seen in many years and we right. see conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. So that's another you know, reason why we're seeing a lot of this. Yeah. We also would believe that people are not putting as much focus and, and faith in liberal democracy and in pluralism, that core value as yeah. Americans that we hold. We're political and civic leaders speak out against us, Carol Brichter, and that's part of what you do is encourage leaders throughout our community, South Florida, you know, to condemn anti-Semitism. You're absolutely right, uh, Michael, and thank you for having the Greater Miami Jewish Federation represented here. We are working not only within the Jewish community, much of what we do in our JCRC is working outside of the Jewish community. We need to stand together, we need to speak out together in all forms of bigotry and hate, obviously for us, anti-Semitism and we need to have those relationships 
before these incidents so that we are creating on a regular basis those kinds of organic and yeah. meaningful Yeah, Michael Bellavan, jump in here. Why do you think is, is behind this alarming rise in hate crimes and anti-Semitism? Well, it's, it's you know, one, one piece people have to remember, what starts with the Jews never ends mm -hmm. with the Jews. And we're now existing in a society that's become far more siloed, polarized. Um, you've got Islamic fundamentalists, you've got people on the left and the right using the Jewish community as a political wedge, and you have supremacists uh, who have always stood for hate and, and look to create that sense of yeah. rather than an us, the other. The other. Mm -hmm. Well, classically, historically, Jews have been labeled the other throughout history. Stephanie, uh, in your work at the FBI and now for Federation, uh, why do you think this is happening? All of the reasons that, mm -hmm. that my colleagues have, have discussed, and probably more reasons that we just don't know. People are individually radicalized, so they have their own ideologies and their own beliefs and their own right. thoughts. Yeah. Uh, if we can, I'm going to ask uh, our director uh, to queue up. This was the video at that uh, hateful rally in Charlottesville by mm -hmm. white nationalists. And what those white nationalists were chanting as they carried torches were, Jews will not replace us. Well, here is what happened on the streets uh, of Charlottesville, where one woman tragically was killed by one of the white nationalists. But in the march, um, if we have that video, uh, these, I mean, it, it, it was shades of Germany in 1937. Mm -hmm. I mean, marching through an American city, uh, Michael chanting, Jews will not replace us. And then they were good people on both sides. That didn't sort of help the equation. No, and, and again, it's, it's the sense of, of politicians, both on the left and the right, mm -hmm. using Jewish community as a wedge. And um, I'm... And, and we speak about this often, the fear of, uh, I hate you because you got him elected, and I hate you because you didn't get him elected. Whenever you take a group and you use them in that yeah. kind mm -hmm. of framework, then you help to promote that sense of the yeah. other, and you yeah. help to create this dissidence from yeah. the other side. Stephanie, one of the challenges for you, and I think for the entire Jewish community and for police, uh, is the fact that some Jews, Orthodox Jews particularly, wear clothing that identifies them mm -hmm. as Jews. Men will wear a kippah, a skull cap, or women uh, will wear a long skirt and a wig. I, I mean, I happen to live in Aventura. I see these people walking to temple every day almost, uh, and, um, and certainly on Friday on the mm -hmm. Sabbath. Uh, and they are, um, tragically, it makes them targets. It's made them Absolutely. targets in New York. Absolutely. Part of uh, the training and the awareness piece that we try to bring to the community, security is no longer siloed. It's everyone's responsibility. So we teach awareness. How do I become a little bit more aware of my surroundings and where I am? Um, a lot of people in this country still walk around with their face in their phone or looking at other things. Right. Being so, more aware of your surroundings. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. When does something look suspicious and, and am I reporting it? Yeah. But you have to know what looks suspicious as well, right? At the Tree of Life Synagogue mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh where 11 Jews were killed at that service uh, when the man burst in, uh, I, I read that you had said that the, the rabbi had been trained yeah. to have his have his cell phone normally when you you know leading a service on the bima mm -hmm. you're not supposed Correct. to have a cell phone but in fact he had it and carol he was able yes. to call and the police were there almost immediately and you know michael it's some of the the most effective means of protecting ourselves are no cost or low cost it's knowing what to do and being trained and then practicing what you're taught and this is what stephanie does throughout the community on an ongoing basis yeah well, what about uh, protecting Jewish schools, day schools, synagogues? I mean, I see at Aventura Turnberry Jewish Center, where I happen to attend services with uh, my life partner, Karen. Uh, I mean, they have a single entrance. They have armed guards there, but that is the norm now, is it, it not? Is, it is. The, the world in and of itself has changed, right? Our threat and our postures have changed. So therefore, I always try to encourage how many layers do you have in your security posture? 
do you have fencing? Do you have bushes? Then mm -hmm. do you have a guard? Then do you have maybe a mechanism that I have to activate to even get into the building? How mm -hmm. many layers have you created um, to better equip yourself? And, and are you advising yourself? people to add new layers, additional layers? Of course I am, always. But the challenge is each synagogue, each facility has their own budgetary right. concerns, right? So that makes it a lot more difficult. Right. Yes, Brian. I would say that when we're looking at security, we're trying to, to find a balance between making sure people are safe and making sure people can still practice their mm -hmm. religion. And we've seen that with this atmosphere in which we're living, it really is impacting the attitudes and perceptions of American Jews. AJC released a survey in October upon the one year anniversary right. of the Tree of Life right. killings. And it showed that nine out of 10 American Jews consider anti-Semitism a serious concern. It also shows that 31% of American Jews have said that they hide publicly their Judaism because they're afraid of attack. And 25% said they avoid Jewish gatherings or events because wow. they're concerned. Yeah, these and we are need alarming numbers. I mean, alarming really. numbers, and, and, and really standing for I think the principle that we have to stand up, we have to be proud of who we are, and we have to look to our allies. Carol mentioned reaching out to other ethnic and religious groups because we know that hatred is not only limited to the Jewish community. We know that there's yeah. hatred against other minorities well, and we his, have to stand Hispanics together. Hispanics and gays, Absolutely. transgender people, I mean, and even in the bigotry Muslim community. And, and, and against Muslims as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, Michael, the, the biggest challenge is that balance. It right. used to be in years past, welcoming versus security. Right. Now, how do we merge those two? Because you still can be welcoming and still have a security posture, right. but it's learning that balance, and that's probably the biggest challenge. Okay, I want to hear about what's going on. Mm -hmm. I know you have a day school there on your property. I want to hear about what you're doing there, so stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back on the Sunday morning on This Week in South Florida. Our topic is anti-Semitism and hate crimes. Michael Bellaband, head of the Broward Jewish Federation. And what about the Posnack Day School, which is there, you know, adjacent to your offices? Uh, what about security there? Been Thank stepped you up? for asking, Michael. Broward County has 10 Jewish day schools, Posnack being, being uh, one of our largest uh, located on the the campus where the Jewish Federation operates, right. and uh, and the Jewish Community Center there as well. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, we've we've uh, designed our security around single access entry, mm -hmm. concentric circles of, of deeper and deeper security to limit people to, to come in. And and the true agony of all of this is, we should be focused on, especially in a day school setting, educating um, the education of our youth. Right. to the future of this country and uh, their own futures and rather the sheer amount of money that we're spent uh, that we're spending on defending and protecting um, takes apart from all of that right and Carol what about the fact that Stephanie is working for Federation but Stephanie you are advising smaller congregations Chabad's others who really don't have the kind of money uh, to have armed guards or other security measures. Right, so we look at other options that are available, and like Carol mentioned earlier, there are some low cost and no cost options. What are they? Um, the simple one of a, a rabbi asking him to please, or her to please carry a phone during service, which they generally mm -hmm. do not, so they could call 911. Maybe vetting and being a little more careful on when you do have visitors, because you know South Florida, we get an influx this time of year right. on visitors, but is there a vetting process? Do we know who's coming? to pray. Yeah. You know, one of the, I, when we spoke on the phone earlier this week, um, you as an FBI agent uh, were part of an investigation into a jihadist who was intent on throwing a bomb into the Aventura Turnbury mm -hmm. Jewish Center and the FBI set up through an informant and you caught that guy. He mm -hmm. was convicted. He is in prison mm -hmm. now. I mean, that's just one of so many incidents that have happened. It is, it is, and they're very hard to predict and to detect. So, you know, kudos to the FBI yeah. that have informants and have undercovers in those positions to... Right. 
Yeah, I want to uh, mention something that is going to happen tomorrow. Here is a sign that uh, Brian Siegel of the AJC brought in. It says hashtag Jewish and proud. And here is part of, if we put this up on the screen, of the message that went with it uh, from Rabbi David Levy. He says, Monday, January 6th, we are calling on all Jews to stand together. Regardless of what we usually wear, we are putting on a kippah or a Magan David necklace or a t-shirt with Hebrew writing on it or whatever we want to wear to show the world that we are Jews, that we stand together and that we are not going to cower in fear. Brian, tell us more about this. Sure. Well, the premise being as Americans and as believers in those values of religious freedom and of pluralism, you know, we want to live in a country and our vision of America is one in which Jews can proudly claim their identity and not be afraid. Right. So for those of us who don't typically wear religious garb, we think it's important to be able to do that without fear. And for our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community who do, as a matter of their faith, wear religious uh, clothing or otherwise, we want them to feel safe and know that there's solidarity amongst ourselves. So we want to declare this day with our friends and allies in the Jewish community and in the non-Jewish community to stand together yeah. because we think it's an important statement to make. And obviously in some ways it's symbolic and a lot of what we've been talking about here is how do we keep the Jewish community safe, but it's also about our values as Americans that we need to understand this is fundamental and it's not just a matter of the Jewish community. This is a matter of our social fabric. It's a matter of standing true for the principles that we believe in. Right, of pluralism, democracy, freedom, justice, and freedom of religion for all people with tolerance. It's not just a Jewish problem, it's a societal problem, and right. we need to stand together for that. Michael, one of the things that I wanted to mention in terms of fortifying or better securing our facilities is that we leverage our private philanthropy with public funding. And over a dozen years ago, the federal government started allocating money specifically to harden these facilities. Right. And every year, our Miami-Dade communities, our Florida community, receives some of that funding. And at Federation, we actually hold workshops to help access that funding for our Jewish communities. And I have to say that uh, Governor Rick Scott, Governor Ron DeSantis, particularly over the last uh, more than eight years, have been very uh, supportive of money from the legislature to help protect. I know uh, Governor mm -hmm. Scott went to your day school, I believe, and said, we are going to protect these kids. So. We toured around with, with Governor Scott, and uh, he provided tremendous support. Um, and uh, the current administration is doing that as well, uh, as well as law enforcement on a regular basis mm -hmm. where we're holding forums and seminars throughout the community, uh, yeah. stop the bleed programs as mm -hmm. well, yeah. really making sure people are trained how to prepare and, and how to, if, yeah. if the unfortunate yeah. happens, be ready for it. Stephanie, what is the Stop the Bleed program which you are conducting or will be conducting? So I'm, product I'm actually conducting it in concert with a few other people. I'm not trained in Stop the Bleed, so I'm bringing in the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. They're actually going to give the training. And we have found, statistically, sh shooting incidents. People have been wounded. Um, with maybe a, an artery bleed yeah. that could have been, the death could have been prevented. So they're going to learn how to apply a simple tourniquet that could save someone's life before EMS right. can arrive. These yeah. are very easy things to learn. Every child should know how to, how to do this as well as every adult. Right. Well, if more people perhaps have been trained at Poway or at Tree of Life, maybe some of those lives could have been saved that uh, were lost. Well, I want to thank you all. I just want to say personally, uh, I have a kippah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wear it tomorrow. I'm not thank Jewish, you, but I support yeah, this movement. Thank so, you for your support. Uh, no, you, tomorrow, I appreciate that, you know, Jewish and proud. Well, non-Jewish and proud. So I will Wonderful. I'll be wearing my skull cap, my yarmulke tomorrow. All right. Thank you all for coming thank in. You, appreciate thank it. you, Michael. Thank you so much. You. All right, up next, we're going to take all the week's hot topics to the roundtable. It has been another tumultuous week in the news. The assassination of General Qasim Soleiman Soleimani in Baghdad. President Trump speaking in Kendall to a huge audience of Christian evangelicals. So we have got a lot of ground to cover with the roundtable. Let me tell you who is with us today. We've got a great one. 
Dara Schottenfeld is a politically engaged, civically attuned attorney in Broward County. She is a partner in the David J. Schottenfeld firm and plantation, former member of the Broward Young Democrats. Mark LaPointe is a partner at the Pillsbury Law Firm in Miami. He is a former federal prosecutor, a Marine veteran of the Gulf War. Fernand Amande, an old friend, is a professional pollster and political pundit, used to host a terrific radio program. I used to like to listen to it. He leads the Ben Dixon Amande firm in Coconut Grove. Welcome to all of you, Dora. Great to have you join us here. Thank you for having me. All right, let's begin with the, sort of the huge story of the week and Mark LaPointe, uh, given your military experience and I think given your judgment, uh, here I think the country is just in a kind of on tenter hooks right now after the assassination of General Soleimani and wondering, you know, the president says, I did this to prevent a war, not to start a war. Uh, and we're all waiting to see, you know, what Iran is going to do. They have vowed profound revenge upon this country. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, you know, my first reaction is uh, Soleimani was a, was a bad man. Mm -hmm. um, he has caused tremendous harm to our, to our country, to our servicemen. In fact, he has been responsible for a number of deaths, American lives in Iraq. He has been literally uh, the, the lead as sort of the proxy, uh, behind a proxy fight yeah. between Iran and the United States. Right, the architect for Hezbollah and all those other militias. Uh, absolutely. <coughs> uh, so there's really no, uh, I, I don't think anyone is sitting here thinking, well, you know, we've lost a good person uh, in, no. in the world. Having said that, however, we do need to ask some questions. One of the questions we need to ask is whether or not the killing of Soleimani actually presented more risk to this country uh, than not. Some of the questions we need to ask, in fact, well, first of all, we need to support my view of the world as, as a former military. We need to support our country. We need to support our president when he comes out and basically right. says, we, we have identified someone who presents grave risk to our country, and right. we needed to do something about it. Having said that, though, we do need to be skeptical about, in fact, whether or not uh, the reason he's provided is, in fact, a legitimate reason. We yeah. haven't heard yet uh, what, what is the basis all for all this. Right. And, and I want to pursue that point, Dara. I mean, what the president, Mike Pompeo, have said is that this, this man posed an imminent threat to our military, our diplomats, uh, at abroad and at home throughout the Middle East, and yet we have yet to hear specifically what the imminent threat was. You're not going to hear what the imminent threat was because there wasn't an imminent threat. The timing of this wasn't strange considering the history of the Trump presidency. It's a wag the dog situation. He wants a distraction from his impeachment and he's gotten it. This is what we're talking about today. We're no longer talking about what he's done wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen and read that it was based on razor thin evidence and they haven't even presented that yet. Yeah. Well, uh, um, Fernando Mandi, uh, we have read that Washington Post had an excellent piece about this where he had flown down to Mar-a-Lago and that uh, his military advisors and Pompeo and um, his national security advisor, uh, Robert O'Brien, were in the room and they presented this sort of list of options of things he could do and killing Soleimani was one of several and he sort of pointed and said let's do that and people were amazed taken aback because they thought you know since both presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama had refused to do that thinking right. it would widen the war uh, they were they were shocked by that. Well I, I think it was a shocking act and I think Mark is right you know one in the American experience has always regardless of their own personal party affiliation been able to line up behind the actions of a president, whether they be Republican or Democrat, to protect the national interest. The problem, Michael, and it's interesting that you cite the Washington Post, is that that paper and other papers across the United States have documented the loss of credibility of this president who has lied, documented falsehoods and lies, over 13,000 <laughs> examples. So before, despite what our partisan positions were, we would have listened to what a president said and taken them at their word and given yeah. them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. This president and this administration operates in bad faith, lies with no compunction, and that's why it's difficult to take them at yeah. face value yeah. now in a situation like this. Yeah, but Mark LaPointe, to, to your point earlier, which is a good one, which is when Ameri the lives of American military men and women and our diplomats, and there are thousands of them 
uh, in Iraq right now who are in peril, uh, uh, the historic way that Americans work is when the president says, you know, we are in a crisis is to get behind him and, you know, make sure that those lives, American lives, are, are not lost. And, and that is the key thing for me. I mean, we know who fights these wars. Right? We yeah. know who are the Guy, guys like you uh, when you wore a uniform. Sure, lots of folks like me and others who who, who basically go out there and put their lives uh, on the line. So we do, and I understand. Look, we do need to question. We do need a certain amount of skepticism. Uh, I myself, when I first heard of this, I was my first reaction was the notion of actually killing someone who was so high in the Iranian government itself uh, demanded serious consideration. Uh, for me, it was almost like, imagine if the, the Iranians decided we're going to kill our defense secretary or joint chief of staff. Mm -hmm. There's no question that would not be allowed. Now, having said that, there's so many questions around this, whether or not, in fact, uh, the organization that he was, uh, he was in charge of, whether or not it was a terrorist organization. There's so many factors. So yeah. my initial reaction is, yes, I agree. President Trump does not merit uh, the grant of any credibility because we know that he's lied about so many things, small and large. But having said that, I would wait to just hear how the facts come out over the next few days, what exactly mm -hmm. he submits, his administration submits as to the purpose, the reason why he felt compelled to actually engage in, in that sort of an act, which will have huge consequences. The Iranians are not going to fight a conventional war. They're not gonna, you're not going to see Iranians' planes coming down Miami. What they're going to do is they're going to do all kinds of unconventional wars to make life very, very difficult for us. Yeah, but uh, having, having said that, I have to say, and I have no knowledge whatsoever, you know, Fernand, here we're going to have a uh, Super Bowl in Miami in, what, two weeks or so, uh, three weeks. And if there were a symbol of Americana, I mean, it is the Super Bowl. And, I mean, the security was already going to be razor tight, I mean, it was going to be... Well, it's not just the Super Bowl. Yes, that's the prime target, but the fact that President Trump spent so much of his time here in South Florida, he's here now at Mar-a-Lago, probably yeah. watching this broadcast. Well, what I happens? Hope he is. Yeah, I'm sure he is, Michael. <laughs> you know he is. And what happens the moment that there is an action that could impact all of our families directly? Then do you look and you place the blame of responsibility on a president who perhaps acted recklessly in this case. We all know that there are many bad men and women around the world with blood on their hands, but there are consequences to actions. I'm offended by the presence of Raul Castro in Cuba who has destroyed so many families in this right. region. Does that mean we should go in and assassinate him right now and, and deal with the potential consequences of that? I'm not sure. To the military's perspective, we have to think about the American blood and treasure that is exposed when actions like this yeah. are taken. Yeah. Uh, Dara, back to your point about impeachment. Um, this week, we saw that uh, uh, late in the week that there still is no agreement uh, between Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell about how this trial is going to take place. Which is very surprising because they typically get along so well. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are at odds uh, all the time. <laughs> but I think there's collegiality. Um, you think, well, I think that there is... Well, I don't know. I, it looks like <laughs> You have a little more faith than I do. Yeah. But uh, do you think that in the end that there are going to be witnesses that will be yes. allowed? Yes, I do. I think the American people will not stand for a fake process. I think even Republicans know that there needs to be some semblance of fairness mm -hmm or it's going to mark the Republican Party forever. And they're already in enough trouble as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I think America wants it and America's going to demand it. And yes, I believe in the end that there will be witnesses. Yeah, well, most trials have witnesses. So Don't let's they? see if this one does. All right, everybody hold your thoughts. Stay with us at home. We'll be back in just a minute with more Roundtable. Welcome back. We are in the midst of a very good roundtable here. Mark LaPointe, Miami attorney with the Pillsbury firm. Dara Schottenfeld from Broward County and Fernand Amande. Fernand, on Friday afternoon, late in the afternoon, I was there at the King Jesus Ministry International uh, in Kendall, an amazing church. It's a beautiful, huge facility. Today, as on most Sundays, they're going to have 7,000 people attending services there led by... Uh, Apostle uh, uh, 
Maldonado, uh, Guillermo Maldonado, who is a really a charismatic figure. Uh, I guess my question is, it seems to me on its face that it's an odd coupling, a kind of a strange marriage between Donald Trump, a famous <laughs> libertine in most of his life, and Christian evangelicals. How do you put that together? You know, it is bizarre because he is arguably the most impious man to ever serve in public <laughs> life. And on top of that, what makes that church in particular, I mean, policy-wise, he has been undoubtedly the most anti-Hispanic president that the United States have ever seen. And so anti-immigration, and most of the people at that church are, are immigrants. That's correct. And many of them are undocumented. That is absolutely correct. But I think, Michael, what that appearance by the president there at that church speaks to are two things, or three things actually. Number one, it was a, a reaction, a desperate reaction to that very unexpected editorial that came out in Christianity Today. Right. Uh, Billy Graham's founded magazine that basically said Donald Trump should not just be impeached, he should be removed. Right. He is an offense to anyone who considers himself an evangelical Christian. They set this event up in Florida and that checks three boxes for them. We know Florida is a must win for the Trump campaign. Right. South Florida, to the extent that they can peel off Hispanic votes, independent voters, that's going to be just sweet spot voting for them. And on top of that, the president is basically spending so much of his time now. He's now a Florida resident. It was an easy little trek for him to get down yeah. there and do that. Yeah. Uh, Mark LaPointe, there were about 5,000 people in that church. And when I say they, idolized Donald Trump. I mean, the, the level yeah. of respect, love for this man, and he loved them back. I mean, and he was powerful, connected with them, ticked off all the issues that are important to them. He, you know, he is pro-life, he's pro-conservative judges, he is pro-Israel. Uh, everything that's important to evangelicals, he listed, and uh, you can see why they, they do support him. You know, uh, certainly, I don't speak for all Christians, I don't speak, I certainly can't speak for all people of faith because clearly people of faith are not a monolithic group. Uh, but I would say it is one of the most phenomenal things that I've uh, experienced, I've observed over the number of years since Trump. Uh, I think as, as Christians, if you go through any church right now, right, any, any house of worship, what are the things they're talking about? They're talking about the fundamental principle of, 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 of faith. That is, there are certain, not a requirement, the, the underlying rock is morality mm -hmm. and 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 in fact if you if you are if you're a christian uh, you know first uh, corinthians 15 33 that says you know if you if you uh, if you basically hang out with with folks without morality then you will be tainted so to me it's been really strange that sort of uh, uh, that adulation that has existed between uh the christians uh, the, the evangelicals and trump and part of me though is is for for i mean for years, for decades, we've heard about family values, how Christians have actually right. talked about the importance of family values. You shouldn't lie, you shouldn't cheat, you shouldn't commit adultery, right. all of those things that, frankly, although they're, they're Christian principles, they're, they're basic, basic fundamental uh, principle of how to live with each other. Right. And basically now, the evangelicals have said, guess what? We're going to align ourselves with someone who actually is the antithesis of all those principles. And my, my question for the, for, for the evangelicals group is, how do you ever get back from that? How do you go back to your community now and mm -hmm. say, it is, it is okay now. I mean, yeah. all the things you've been teaching as Christians now, they still matter. How do you tell your children now? I mean, would you trust your children with, yeah. with, 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 yeah. with this Well, person? you know, there was, I have to say, an, an answer at one point. There were eight members of the clergy who prayed for him, laying on of hands. It was really quite moving. And what one of them, I think it was uh, Pastor Maldonado, said was, we know he is a sinner, but we love him. And, you know, he, if he accepts Jesus, you know, as his savior, then we can be with him. I mean, it was a, a generous Christian message of redemption. It really was, especially considering that this is a man who says he never apologizes for anything. Yeah. Um, evangelicals support Republicans because of Israel mostly. Yeah. Um, yeah, because when the rapture comes, you want to be on the right side. Yeah, I mean, they get raptured up and we burn. <laughs> I mean, my people are aware of it. Um, but I, I remember them calling out Obama. I mean, calling him the Antichrist. And here's yeah. a man who has been with his wife forever. He's a, a, a family man, an actual family man. And then the hypocrisy of supporting a man that is the opposite of moral. I mean, I, 
immoral doesn't even cover him. It's astounding. Well, he is, as I said earlier, however, they forgive him and he's right on their issues. So hold your thoughts. We'll have more to say about the president and hear a soundbite from him. We'll be back with more Roundtable in just a minute. Welcome back. We are in the midst of another roundtable having a really good conversation. Uh, we were talking about President Trump uh, in Kendall on Friday, and there was something he said that I admired a lot. It sort of refers to the uh, theme earlier where we were talking about anti-Semitism. Let's listen to the president. So we're going to eradicate the sinister scourge of anti-Semitism. And we will protect Jewish communities and all members of the Jewish faith from the wicked forces of hatred and violence. All right, Dara, there and you, you know go. That. That's the kind of thing you want the president to say, but you're shaking your head. Because more than wanting him to say it, I want him to mean it. This is the same man who, after Charlottesville, said that there were very good people on both sides. He's supported by David Duke. Him standing there and saying, oh, anti-Semitism is bad, while refusing to speak out and say, no, I don't want your support, is beyond the pale. I, I, he's not telling the truth for a change. Um, you know, Fernand, one of the things I have to say that I found, he's powerfully connects. The guy, when he is on and speaking to an audience, it's really an amazing experience to, to listen to him. But you know, right when he was on a roll, suddenly he started talking about Hillary Clinton okay. again. Goodness, that was three years ago. I mean, you know, he talked about Beto O'Rourke. Uh, he called um, Elizabeth Warren Pocahontas. He called Pete Buttigieg, whose name he mispronounced and sort of ridiculed, uh, Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine. Um, well, that's very Christian behavior in the church, isn't it? To just start insulting people left and right, Michael? I guess the, the, the question is, uh, is this the tone of the 2020 election? Oh, it's been the tone of Donald Trump his entire life. I think, unfortunately, it's it harbinger for what we're going to see. And look, let's give the devil his due. Um, he, his comments about anti-Semitism, I think, are to be applauded. I just don't think it can end at the level of anti-Semitism. Hate crimes across the board against Muslims, against Jews, against even folks that are not of faith have increased substantially right. over the last three years of his presidency. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that those words are supported by acts. I'll give you a quick example here in South Florida. We had a situation last year where there was a South Florida police officer who was found engaging in anti-Semitic oh, yeah. conduct. Right, he was, he was throwing the, the Jewish Hebrew Bible you know, dismissively into a And literally truck. called it trash. Let's yes. toss this trash. Yeah. The chief of police of Miami at the time, Jorge Colina, could have gone many different routes. He took a zero tolerance approach, right. fired the officer immediately and said, look, we have to put these issues on the table and deal with them in real time. Yeah, Not he, just talk about them, need. but effectively deal with them. Yeah, I think Kalina that's the type of thing we need. Kalina's been the greatest, I think, so far in that yeah, regard. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, before we run out of time, I think we need to sort of remark that, um, uh, Mark, here we are, a new year, a new decade. Uh, let me ask you to kind of look over the horizon a little bit and say, here's something I see coming in 2020, which is going to be good for our community. Let me just begin by saying, I think that we have a lot of elected leaders now who really recognize that climate change mm -hmm. is just a, a crisis and will be addressed. And I think $200 million for Everglades restoration is just terrific. So I'm kind of encouraged about that. Well, I'm, I'm generally an uh, optimistic, positive person in any event. So I'll, oh, I, I tend to see life, uh, sort of the glasses half full. But I think even in the midst of our uh, most difficult time, we can see some good things. When we talk about some of the things that, that the Jewish community has been gone through right now, I think it's an opportunity for all of us as Americans to basically uh, engage uh, at a higher level. Right. I, my, my sense of things is when we talk about some of the uh, hate that's been going on, it is not merely, uh, the, you know, a concern just for the Jewish community. Right. right? It, is a, is it, it is an American concern. And I believe right. that folks from all kinds of faith, from all creeds and color, ha will have an opportunity, have an opportunity now to basically speak up against those things. Because, right. frankly, the hate that the Jewish community is experiencing now uh, it does not stop it's, at the doors. No, of, it of does the not, so, and so it's I think, intolerable. Absolutely. Yeah, Dara, what do you see that makes you feel encouraged? 
Um, probably the involvement of women in the political process. Mm. Um, I think that there's a level of compassion that comes with when women lead. Um, I find that women are lifting each other up more than ever. Yeah. I am greatly encouraged by where women are heading in 2020. Right. I'm afraid that's going to be the last word. Saw Little Women last night. Pretty darn good, too. I would, I would encourage you all. All right, Fernand, uh, Dara, and Mark, thank you for coming in. So to come, my personal perspective about the president and the evangelicals, not exactly a marriage made in heaven. And here is a live look now from our tower cams across South Florida. And here is Weather Authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with your Sunday forecast. Brandon. Hey, good, uh, good afternoon. Couldn't ask for a better afternoon. Nice way to end out the weekend. Lots of sun. It was chilly out this morning, though. We are into the middle 50s in some places. That's a big change from the record heat that we saw yesterday afternoon. Now, temperatures not rising as fast as you may think. They're up into the mid to upper 60s. We're pretty close to our highs and we're kind of flatlining here. So I think we may get to 68, maybe as high as 69 degrees. And then we'll start falling off again as we get towards this evening. In fact, it's likely to be cold tonight than what we saw earlier this morning. More 50s, low 50s on the way later on tonight. And that gradual warm up through the 70s. Highest rain chance on there is 30%. It's a good looking week. Brendan, thank you. All right, before we leave you today, a personal perspective about the Christian evangelicals and President Trump at first blush. This is not a marriage made in heaven, but we saw proof this week. It still works. On Friday, the president was greeted like a rock star or an Old Testament prophet by a huge crowd at the King Jesus International Ministry in West Kendall. It is one of the largest churches in the country. 7,000 people worship there on Sunday and on Friday. They pretty much worship Donald Trump. It was easy to see why, listening to his speech, he is pro-life, pro-Israel, pro-Second Amendment, pro-more conservative judges, and against socialism. Mr. Trump gave a stem winder of a speech. He can connect with people like few others. Certainly loves the sound of his own voice. He had an audience that loves it too. But his speech, while powerful, was full of non sequiturs, pointless bragging, wild exaggerations, factual errors, and egotistical preening. Here is one example. And we are right now building a very big, very powerful, very strong, very high wall, and it's going up. Close to 100 miles have already been built. While you hear that and you shake your head and wonder, here is the president, famous for his xenophobia, telling an audience of mostly immigrants that he is building more border wall to keep immigrants out. And the audience stands and cheers him. Talk about cognitive dissonance. Some things just cannot be explained rationally. And one of them is this bond between Trump and evangelical straight shooters, high moral standards. Trump has been married three times, openly had an affair while married to his first wife, paid hush money to a porn star, is being sued for alleged sexual harassment by a dozen women, said he could grab women by their private parts, and yet he is hailed as a hero by these conservative Christians. The world sometimes is a very strange place and cognitive dissonance is king. That is my perspective for this week. Hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. We'll see you next Sunday.